Hi, and welcome to Parashat Shoftim. And in this parasha, we have uh, all the discussion about judges and officers, the death, death penalty for idol worshipping, the king of Israel, priestly gifts, prophecy, the city of refuge, conspiring witnesses and what to do with them, war, preserving fruit trees, and the unsolved murder. As always, and typical of the Parashat Devarim, loads of different subjects to go through. Let's see if we can explore it together. So let's start at the beginning, chapter 16, verse 18, and, it's, and it says, You shall appoint judges and officers in all your cities, and they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. And Pasuk 20, righteousness, righteousness, you will pursue. Tzedek, tzedek, tirdof. So that you will live and possess the land that God Hashem has, has, prov- has given to you. And the important thing for us to note is that even those who appoint judges are not above the law. The judges have dominion over those that appoint them. And verse 19 where it says you should not pervert judgment, a faulty decision in the human courts is the equivalent of corrupting the whole system of justice that Hashem has set up. And this is a fascinating idea that the Asha suggests that what the judges decide here in this world is only a reflection of what's already been decreed up in the heavens. And judges are warned not to show any favoritism to either the either parties. Hakarat Banim, because ultimately judges are called to concentrate on that on he who has no faith, namely Hashem. And it is his sense of justice that must be upheld. And so you must not accept bribe and not even have any favoritism to anybody in your mind. And judges are warned not to uh, uh, apply any favoritism, even if they think that as a result of that, there will be more harmony between the two parties. Because the Torah says if they do that, then the next time the judges are more inclined to perverse the judgment for their own personal honor. And verse 10 that says, Tzedek, Tzedek, Tidof, the al suggests that even if a judge was to find you favorable in his decision, and you know in your heart that the judgment is wrong, that you were in the wrong, then you're called to, to speak up and make the judge aware of that so that the heavenly judgment is not perverted. In other words, don't be silent and let the judge bear the burden of his error. Use your free will to redress injustice. Because judges are ultimately the mouthpiece of Hashem, or at least that's how they should be when they're judging according to the Torah laws. And there are three areas uh, where the judges have to judge. In areas to do with the written Torah, rabbinical law, and those of tradition. And now let's turn to the whole question of kingship. It's fascinating in chapter... 17 verse 14, when you come to the land that Hashem your your God gives you and possess it and settle in it, you will say, I will set a king over myself like all the other nations around me. And the Asher says, is this a commandment or is it merely a prediction? I mean, surely God is our only and ultimate king. So how would it please him for us to create a physical king? And a king's function, uh, the Asher says, is to lead the people into war. But isn't that Hashem's role? We said so many times in our learnings that uh, you, we have to, the Bene Israel have to prepare for war, but in, in the knowledge that actually Hashem conducts the war on our behalf. And so it may not be so surprising that after 300 years, Shmuel, the prophet, is actually upset with Ben Israel because they finally asked for a king. But if it's part of our laws, why should that be a problem? And the Alsha suggests that God is is actually felt rejected when the Jewish people ask for a physical king. And why should that be the case? The Alsha said it. It's like the soldier that captures an attractive female prisoner. She's permitted to him, even by Torah law, under very strict conditions, even if she was married. And the law is structured in this way, so it saps away the power of the libido of the man, the evil urge. And in the same way, the laws of kingship are there to undercut the power of the evil urge in the form of the multitude of the people to adapt ways of other nations. So the prophet Shmuel was angry because 
The Jewish people requested a king just so that they could be like the other nations and not because it was a mitzvah. But God in his infinite mercy to us says, since I know that one day you are going to request for a king just because the other nations have one, then do it in the disguise of one of my commandments. It's a very beautiful sentiment. It's like a parent who doesn't want his child to do a certain thing, but knows that eventually he will. And so he instructs the child to do it so that at least he can do it whilst honoring the parent's wishes. Such is the depth of the love between God and his people. And have you ever wondered, as it says in verse 16, why a king is not allowed to have too many horses or wives or too much gold and silver? And Pirkei Avot uh, chapter 3 says there are three intrinsic reasons which leads to us producing sinful actions. The first is arrogance or conceit. The second is a lust for physical pleasure and physical gratification. And the third is dishonest conduct. And in order to combat the first, the Pirkei says, remember your origin. You came from a, a, a smelling drop. This is to counter any arrogance or conceit. And that is what having too many horses produces. In order to encounter the second, we're reminded where we're going to end up with, and that is full of worms and dust. And this is to counter our focus on physical gratification, which having too many wives will end up doing for you. And if the king becomes guilty of any of these three, then there will be serious repercussions for not only him, but the, the, the people that he governs. And now let's turn to priestly matters. Chapter 18, verse 1. There shall not be for the Kohen and the Levites, the entire tribe of Levi, any portion or inheritance in the land, because he will eat the offerings of Hashem, and his inheritance is that portion. And then it says, this shall be the due of the Kohen. mishpat Kohanim. And the al asks, why is it that we're reminded now that the priests and the, and the Levites don't have a share in the land of Israel? We already know this. And he gives us a beautiful psychological reason for that. But first he introduces us to the idea that there are three crowns, the crown of Torah, the crown of priesthood, and the crown of kingship. A king has to be appointed, and a Torah crown is only achieved through hard work. And which of those do you think is the odd one out? Well, the crown of kingship uh, has to be a, one that is appointed. A king is appointed by the people. The crown of Torah has to be worked at and toiled at in order to achieve that. But what about the crown of priesthood? That's just inherited. The priest does nothing to obtain it. And so there could be a psychological resentment for the Jewish person who's worked really hard for his labor to give away a certain percentage to the Levim who's done nothing to earn it. And so the Torah tries to head off such argument by saying two things. Firstly, that unlike you, rest of Israelis, the priests and the Levites don't have any inheritance in the land of Israel. And secondly, what you're giving to them is not yours to give, it's mine, it's Hashem's. And I'm appointing them to, to eat that portion that is due to me. And remember the al says that were it not for Pinchas, None of the Jewish people would will, will be there. We would all have perished in the plague. And the task of the priest is to devote his life to Torah study, and that is his inheritance. And that's perhaps why it says, Zeyye Mishpata Kohanim, because don't think it's your merit that, that is a result of the, you giving them their portion. This is Hashem's law. This is Hashem's justice. And since neither the priest or the Kohen have a right to ask you for their share, the Torah said to ten law, you must give to him. Hashem, he was born with such a status, don't begrudge him for his share. And from here we learn that poverty has a greater stature than great wealth, as Hashem has given a superior status to those who depend on others for their livelihood, i.e. the priests and the koni. And that perhaps is why kings need extra legislations to restrict and restrain their their appetite, because the rich face additional temptations in life. And these added legislations are there to help them fight their evil urge. 
And just in case the evil urge persuades them to give up their world to come, the Torah stresses that following these laws, the wealthy and the rich will achieve a long life. And now let's turn the eye to the idea of idol worshipping. And why is it that people worship idols? We might come to the conclusion that the very abstract nature of Hashem means that He's not really interested in exercises influence on the world, which is a very materialistic entity. And this leads to people to incorrectly worship the idols and the luminaries, thinking that it is they who are in charge of the physical world. And Moshe says, Ben Israel, you have seen with your own eyes the very involvement in every detail of your lives of Hashem. And therefore, don't make the same mistakes as other nations in trying to find or believing you need to connect to God through intermediaries. Let your loyal conduct uh, and belief in Hashem not depend henceforth in any personal experience of Hashem's generosity. Even if you think that you have not received your just rewards, don't let that affect your loyalty to Hashem. And that true perfect faith can only be expressed in your private home where you don't have the influence of trying to impress any neighbors. And in verse 16, we go to the idea of prophecy. And what is a prophet? Fascinatingly, prophets after Moshe are very different. Moshe is a conduit between the Jewish people and God. Future prophets are just there to connect God's word to the Jewish people downwards, but not the other way around. Future prophets' function is to make Israel listen to God's words. And do you know anybody who still looks at the horoscopes and determine, to use that as determining how good their day will be? Well, if anybody still believes in the horoscopes and how the mazal can affect their destiny, let them contemplate on the fact that of the seven nations of Canaan, when we had battle with them, not a single Kenani escaped that, and not a single Jewish soldier was lost. That outcome is inconceivable if you're a believer in horoscopes and mazalim. And now let's turn to chapter 19, verse 4, this idea of the unintentional killer. And look at the words, it's very fascinating. It says, this is the matter of the killer who shall flee there and live. There's a contrast between killing somebody and fleeing in order to live yourself. And in verse 5 where it says, Asher yavo, or will come to, this is an illusion that an intentional killing is something that was decreed beforehand in the heavens. It was something that was meant to happen. In other words, Hashem creates circumstances that lead to events that carry out a previous decree of judgment for both the victim and the perpetrator. It could be that each one had escaped uh, judgment from a previous action in the earthly courts, and this is Hashem's way of rectifying things. And now let's look at chapter 20, verse 1. When you go, and, when you go out to battle against your enemy, a people more numerous than you, you should not fear them, for Hashem your God is with you who brought you up from the land of Egypt. It shall be that when you draw near to the war, the Kohen shall approach and speak to the people. And the Kohen says, let, you, let your heart not be faint. Don't be afraid. Don't panic. Don't be broken before them. For Hashem your God is the one who goes with you and to fight for you and to save you. Please notice that the phrase Kiti Tzele Melchama is actually in the singular. And then afterwards, we revert to the plural, especially when we're talking about the, the enemies. And over here, we have a really key secret to the success in war. And that is, as we've discussed before, the real key is to be unified as a nation. And that was the purpose of the priest, to instill confidence in the people who are going to wage war. And the key word here is when you approach the battlefield. In other words, we're not talking about when you fight because God does the fighting for us. It's just when you approach the battlefield, in order for Hashem to do the miracles for us, we have to be in a state of complete trust and lack of fear. Why should we fear when we know that God is work, doing the fighting for us? There's nothing to fear. And that's what the priest reinforces. And finally, let's turn to chapter 20, verse 19, where it's talking about when you...
besiege a city for many days to wage war against it and to seize it, do not destroy the trees by swinging an axe against it. For from it you will eat and you shall not cut it down. And then there's a reference to a man being the tree of the field. And I understand this reference of not repaying kindness, uh, which is what the trees provide in shade and fruit, not to repay kindness with insensitivity by cutting it down. But there's an intrinsic anomaly here. Are you telling me that we can kill and cut down the enemy people, but not their trees? Are you suggesting that God is more interested in the trees than, the, than he is of man? And the Ashraf says that sometimes man can be like a tree in the field, seemingly unproductive. But if he was to descend and to act in a way that's aggressive to you and he wants to kill you, something that a vegetation would not even be capable of doing, in that situation you can actively attack him first. And that's it for Parashat Shoftim. That's what we have time for, but I want to leave you with this beautiful bracha. And that is that as we're approaching the, the Rosh Chodesh Elul this week, the month in which we try to be connected much more with God. How can we do that? How can we become much more connected with God? And so it's exactly this month where the, the Melech Basadeh, the king, is in the field. He's accessible. He's approachable. He wants us to reach out to him, especially now. May we use this time very wisely, use the tunes of the Selichot, if you're Sephardi, to connect with God, to yearn for Him. Use the Chokli Israel, which we've been learning in the Al Shah Academy, to echo back to God His very words that He's put in the Torah. Let's allocate more time to Hidbodudud and to contemplate what it is God wants us to do and what it is that we want to use our free will to create in this world. And all this in preparation for the big day Rosh Hashanah where the whole of our future life will be judged and determined. My teacher Rabbi Kiva Tats in London used to tell us that Rosh Hashanah is when God allocates all the jobs for that coming year. So think about this, what kind of job would you like God to give you? How would you like to use the skills that God has given you uniquely to advance God's desire for the world? Are you happy to be satisfied with a spectator's role? Or would you like something more active? We were each brought down to this world to do our unique task. But what is that task? And how should we use our free will and imagination to determine the characteristics of that for this year? All great questions to hopefully put you in the right mindset to make the most of Rosh Hashanah. I wish you Shabbat Shalom. God bless and see you next week.